him a great company of people. Have you ever noticed everywhere Jesus went there was a crowd? Yes, everywhere he went, yes, from the time he was born to the time of his death, there was a crowd. Yes, and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wounds that never bear and the paths that never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Come over us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And we know that story there, the crucifixion. We know about the two thieves that was there. One died to sin, one died in sin, one died for sin. I love that song, but the man in the middle. Amen. Jesus being the Savior of the world. Yes, Thank God for Calvary. Amen. Next weekend we're going to celebrate yes. the epitome of our faith. Amen. That is Easter Amen. Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, the fact that Jesus arose from the dead, victorious over yep. death, hell, and the grave. Amen. And that is a wonderful truth. And we don't just celebrate it one time a year. We celebrate it every day of the year. Yes. Especially during springtime, we see everything coming to life, symbolizing once again that Jesus is alive and yes. God ain't dead. Amen. Calvary is the focus of our faith. To the world, it symbolizes death, but to the believer, it symbolizes life. That is where we begin our journey, but to the world, it looks as though that's where you end your journey. But every person that is born again has been there through the eyes of faith, Amen. and they have seen Christ crucified for their sin Amen. and for the sins of others as well. Calvary has many names. It's called Golgotha. It's called uh, the place of the skull, the mount, uh, the hill, or some even call it Mount Moriah, which is the same place where Abraham offered up his son Isaac. And Calvary is a very unique place. It's a place where the, where the crosses was hung there in Jerusalem. I want to use the word tonight, Calvary. I don't preach many acrostic sermons, but this is what I felt led to do tonight. I just wrote down a few things in an acrostic. You can write down the word Calvary, and I'm going to throw you some points out with those words or those letters at what it means to me. Number one, Calvary is a place of cruelty. There's no other picture of cruelty any more gruesome than what you'll find at Calvary. There's been a lot of people that died deaths in this life down here. Some have died by botch or what they call botch electric chair executions where they didn't go exactly right, where things would go wrong and it looked very cruel and inhumane. They try to make these inmates on death row when they die, they want them to. When they execute them, they try to make it a humane execution where the visible appearance of death is very minimal. You won't be able to see the gruesomeness of what really takes place when somebody goes out of this life into eternity. They go to great lengths making sure that the drugs have been approved by the government to make sure that when they are administered to a body that death is instantaneous and the shutdown is as painless as possible. They want the inmate to feel little pain if no pain at all. But I can promise you this, if that inmate that is executed has not been born again, it don't matter how much they try to minimize his pain, he's going to feel the sting of death shoot them, have them in front of a firing squad. A lot like ISIS is doing now over in the Middle East. They'll put them up in a row where I, I forget 40 some Christians they murdered the other week. They held them up with guns and they mowed them down. And uh, Adolf Hitler back during the Holocaust when they were killing Jews by the thousands and even the millions over there. The cruelty on those people's lives and the inhumanity that they experienced as they would roll their bodies over into a hole in the ground and they'd just let the 
buzzards feast on their carcasses and it was so cruel and yeah. terrible even today where people are beheaded where they'll take a sword and cut off somebody's head and it falls there on the ground and they hold them up even on TV so today and YouTube symbolizing victory and the cruelty that man goes through when they die some of these cruel deaths whether you're a prisoner or maybe a capture or enemy of war or a prisoner of war but in spite of all of those great events that are cruel and how awesome and gruesome they really are there's never been another cruel act as cruel as the one that took place at Calvary as they scourged him and whipped him with the cat of nine tails there in Pilate's hall and those cat of nine tails what it was made of had nine things made of bone and, and pottery and all kinds of just shrapnel it'd be wrapped up in leather and it looked kind of like a claw like a cat claw that's why they called it a cat of nine tails and it had nine fingers on it and it had a stick a lot of people think it was a whip but it was not a whip it was a pole and they would take that cat of nine tails and some of them was six feet long some of them would be even three feet long the ones that were shorter would make the pain even worse because they'd feel the impact even more and they'd take that cat of nine tails and they'd beat Jesus with it as they tied him to the pole and they put a crown of thorns on his head and they stuck him in the side and as they'd pull that cat of nine somewhere around 300 pounds made him carry his own so he walks up that hill and he gets up there he's done been beaten, scourged and whipped he's bleeding beyond recognition some people say how bad did he look he looked so bad that his face was marred that you couldn't even know who yeah, he was right. yeah. that's exactly right blood was falling out of him the whole time he was going up Calvary and he gets up there on the hill and they lay him down on that cross and normal Roman crucifixion was to take ropes and tie their hands and feet to the pole. But not this man. They took nails and they drove them one in each hand and one in this hand and one in his feet. And then after they'd done that, they stood it over there next to the hole and they stood that cross up all at one time. And as they went down into that hole, the jarring of his hands and his feet, he continued to bring excruciating pain. And many people mocked at him. Others was in the background weeping. My mind can't help but wonder where was Thomas at? Where was my Bartimaeus at? Where was the, heal, the multitude that he healed? Where was the people that he had raised from the dead? I don't know, but I can't help but think maybe they was in the background weeping as the darling Son of God went through the cruel punishment that he went through there at Calvary. No man had ever suffered. It was so bad that Jesus even said, if it be your will, I'll let this cup pass from me. That's how bad it was. And yet he died. Cruelty. Calvary is a picture of cruelty. The A, atonement, it's a picture of atonement, bloodshed. Yeah. Yeah. Why must there be bloodshed? That tells us what Calvary is all about. Amen. 
Calvary is about you and it's about me. It's about our sin and had to be atoned for. In other words, there had to be a payment for your sin and mine. God was mad at us because of our sin. And either you and I was going to die and pay the penalty ourselves, right. or Jesus was going to die for us and the yeah. blood that He shed Amen. would pay the atonement and the sacrifice for your sin and mine. Amen. That's why you ought to thank God for the blood. Yeah. I can't yeah. understand why people want to take away the blood of the about the atonement. It's about the blood of Jesus. Number three, Calvary, the C, cruelty, the A, atonement, the L, love. Yes. That's why He died. Calvary is about love. <laughs> no greater love hath any man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. That is amazing. We talk about our veterans and thank God for all of them. We have several in here. And I'm going to plan a big veteran Sunday here in July the 4th, Lord willing, and have some kind of Independence Day celebration and honor all of our veterans. But thank God for our veterans. And you know, I read something one day on the internet about, about there's only two defending forces that's ever died for your freedom. One's the American soldier and the other is Jesus Christ. One died for your soul and the other one died so that you might have liberty. Jesus, His love. A soldier, they say, and they fight because they love their country. They love America. These men in here fought for the America because they love their country. They love their freedom. They love. But Jesus died because He loved you, friend. He died for the whoremonger and the hearted. He loves the wicked. He loves everybody. There's never been anybody he ain't never loved him, friend. That's why He hung in Calvary. It was the love that He had for you and I. You're looking unto Jesus. That's why the writer of Hebrews said to look unto Him, the author and finisher of our faith, yes. who for the joy that was set before Him. What was the joy? The love of being yes. united with His people. Amen. The joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set on the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeah. His love. Why is it that we have such a hard time loving people when He loves people regardless? That's hard to believe. And you know what? Sometimes the people we don't like the most are the ones that are the most like us. Right. <laughs> I choose to hear. Uh, yeah. Love. Just loving people. And he died. He showed his love for you and I. The L. The V. Victory. Amen. All of our victories there at Calvary. Yes, yeah. Sir. yeah. That's where we get the victory. That's where we get victory over sin. That's where we get victory over fear and worry. And that's where we get the victory at. And we have the victory tonight simply because of Calvary. Amen. The A, what's this? Alone. Jesus said there at Calvary, the most painful time in his life, and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yes. If there's any time in your life you want God there, it's when you're hurting like you've never Amen. hurt before. Right? Amen. And yet Jesus felt God forsaken in his own heart. Why did he do that? Because God could not look on sin, right. and God could not look at what was going on. That was because Jesus became a curse for all of us because yes, he was hung on a tree, Amen. and he was alone. Next time you feel like you're alone and nobody cares and nobody's around, think about Him. Amen. The Comforter. Amen. The one who had supplied everybody's needs. You ever feel like you're putting so much into your life and everybody else's life and you're getting nothing in return? Yes, sir. You ever feel like you're the only one doing anything and nobody else really cares? You ever feel like you're the only one in your marriage that's really involved or trying to keep the thing together? And you wonder what in the world's going on and nobody just and if you ain't careful we'll all get the pout and spell it once in a while. Like I'm the only one really doing anything. But if she doesn't have as much as I did, we'd be in the home up every shame. <laughs> but usually it's the other way around. If he does half as much as she did, then it'd probably be in a whole lot better shape. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Imagine Jesus putting everything into it. He didn't have to do it. No, he didn't. And he was all alone. And nobody there to comfort him. Nobody there to tell him it's going to be all right. 
You know why? Because he had to feel being rejected. He was made sin for you and I. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He didn't know no sin, <clears throat> but he was made sin. Yes, I studied that one day, Brother Terry. What that means is Jesus never did rape nobody, but he knew what it was like to feel the guilt and the shame of a rapist. All made right. You think about it. My, my. Jesus never abused a child because he called all the children to come to him, but he felt the guilt and the shame of what a child abuse would feel. Well, that's hard to think about, man. Jesus never killed nobody, but he knew what it was like to feel the guilt and the shame of a murderer. You think about that, man. There's nothing anybody in this earth can do that Jesus don't know exactly how they do. And he done it all along. It says it laid on him the iniquity of us all. all. Amen. The iniquity of all of us was laid on him. Everything. Everything. Not one sin was not laid upon him. Everything. Huh. He knew what it was like to be a drunkard, to feel like feel the shame and the guilt. Be home, be a busted, yet he never drunk any strong drink. You think about everything that he went through and went at it alone. And he had to because people turned their backs on him. The ones that he'd done the most for were the ones that eventually turned their backs on him and left him. Yeah. Yeah. Calvary. Jesus. What he went through for you and I. Sometimes we forget about the magnitude of all that he went through. My mind still can't fathom and get off of the idea of when Jesus said, when he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, if it be your will, let this go from me. He knew what was coming. He said, if it be your will, I don't want to go through this if it be your will. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He saw how bad it was going to be. One of the hardest things in life is for somebody to turn on you, especially when you've done nothing but good to them. That hurts. And they falsely accuse you of things that you've never done to them. That makes me mad. Yes, sir. There's anything that makes me want to burn people's house down this way. Yes, sir. Now, if I'm guilty, that's one thing. Yes. But if I ain't guilty and somebody accuses me of it, that makes me mad. Real mad. Imagine how Jesus felt being accused of this time. Did you sit there and took it? Yes, he did. Alone. Nobody to text him. Nobody to call him. Nobody there to pat him on the back. Nobody to encourage him and say everything's going to be all right. He went at it all by himself. My, my. Hello. <clears throat> then the only one he had to hold on to, God said, okay, now that you're going through that, God turned his back on him. That's the only time God ever turned his back on anybody. And he turned it on his own son. Now imagine if God had turned his back on you and I. That's a wonderful thing that he did. You better thank God that he turned his back on his son instead of us. Yeah. Yes. And yet we have sometimes, we get the big head and the idea. And we think this Christian life is all about us. And we get mad at people and upset. Because somebody treats us a little wrong. We don't shake our hand. And looks at us a little bit funny. And we get all out of sorts. And our feathers get ruffled. And we fluff up and we get mad. And we forget about everything that Jesus went through. We ain't got no right to get mad at nobody. Amen. It's a blessing we're even here. Calvary's what made it possible that we could all be where we are. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. And for some reason or other, when people go to Calvary, they get religious all of a sudden. And they turn Christianity into some kind of form of religion. It's just a form. That's all it is. Christianity is revolving around a gruesome activity that took place at Calvary. And Jesus suffered and died alone. I got another one. The R, rejoice. There's one thing that ought to cause a Christian to rejoice at Calvary. <laughs> That's what we got to rejoice about. That's why we come to church and we sing those songs. That's why this morning I'm going to come in. Thank God for coffee when you're tired and wore out from Red Bull. Yeah, I come in, man, I was 
Lord was just charging me up. We got the choir up there. I said, we need to sing them on the wind inside. Just rejoice about it. And that's why. Yes, sir. Lord, to be happy and rejoicing about life in general. It could be a whole lot worse. You're right. Amen. I mean, yes, you say, how much worse could it be? It could be a whole lot worse. Yes, sir. The Tar Heels could be in the final four. <laughs> 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 but they ain't and neither say that is for sure rejoicing rejoicing in him and his finished work at Calvary that's what we need to rejoice in us figure this last time done the why you that's what Calvary means Calvary you Calvary is for you and me that's what it was all for let me tell you that song when he was on the cross we was on his mind you and I were on the mind of him. Amen. 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 Right. Right. I couldn't help but think about us. Wow. That's it. The joy. Let me tell you what. You think about all the millions of people that have died and been born and died and born and died since Calvary. He thought about every single one of us. Yes, he did. We were on his mind when he was there at Calvary. We thank God for Calvary. What would we do without Calvary? That's the reason we're here. There's still power in the blood, and that story yeah. never gets old. And next week, we're going to celebrate the end result of Calvary. And that's the resurrection that took place. You know, they took him down off of that tree. They come by there after usually six hours. They would come by and they would break the legs of the of the ones that were on the cross. And the reason they'd do that is so that they'd suffocate. They'd break the legs of the ones on the cross, and they would go down like this, and what it would do is cause their arms to go up, and it would collapse their lungs after a while. They'd break their legs, and they'd just have to hang there, and put pressure on the lungs, and they'd end up suffocating. But when they come to Jesus, we all know that he'd already give up the ghost and was dead. And just to make sure, they put a, took a spear and stuck it in the side, and out come water mingled with blood. And we do know that all of his blood come out. Now, some of you commentaries are going to say, and listen up, younger generation, this country and this world is minimizing the effect and the impact of the blood of Jesus. Amen. It was the Amen. literal blood Amen. of Jesus that satisfied God. Amen. 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 Don't ever let a preacher or a theologian Amen. or a teacher or anybody tell you that it was not the literal blood of Jesus because it was. Yeah. And if they say it wasn't, then they're a heretic. Amen. It was the little blood. How come that blood made the water? They took it down off the cross. They took him and they put him in a tomb. And then there was a conspiracy. Because after he arose from the dead, they began to say that some had come and stole his body. And they said that, you know, that he really did die. He didn't get up from the grave. And there was a big conspiracy that they said around that. But how are you going to do this? After Jesus got up from the grave, after they buried him in the bar tomb, we all know that, that when Jesus got up, the earthquake that shook the ground during that time opened up all the other graves that was around, and there was a resurrection right after Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. You can read the Bible. Yeah. And it says they walked down through the streets of Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's something I want you to think about. In Luke chapter 24, 23 I think it is. No, 24. It talks about how that there was a great earthquake. Or it might have been John that mentioned. It said there was a great earthquake. Great earthquake and even bigger. But he got so far away from the earthquake and went straight. How many earthquakes were there in those three days? Think about it. This earth felt the results of what was happening. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, because sir. God was doing something. Yes, Amen. That had never been done before. Yes, sir. And the whole world felt the effects of Calvary Amen. and the resurrection. Amen. Now imagine. That crowd tried to say, well, they stole his body. Imagine all the dead people walking through town. Yeah. Now, I, I've got a lot of questions. I know it happened. The Bible says it did. Yeah. Where did they go? Where did they go? Secondly, who all was it? 
had to be people that were saved, Old Testament saints. Now that's what I'm thinking. But where did they go? The Bible doesn't say nothing about it. Now, so we say, well, that leaves room for speculation and calls me to scratch my head. No, here's my conclusion. My conclusion is this, that the resurrection of Christ was so great, don't worry about where they went. Right. Worry about where he went. That's right. Man. That's good. Right. That's good right. And what's so great is not the fact that they got up, but that he got up first. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 The death that he died. It's an amazing thing. And there's so much power in it, and people have been talking about it for over 2,000 years now. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And nobody's died of death like that since. <clears throat> right. And they didn't kill Jesus. But Jesus gave his life Amen. up. Amen. Amen. Nobody killed him. Amen. He gave it up himself. Thank God for Cal. Thank God for Lord, we love you. Thank you for our time this evening together tonight. Give us a good time of fellowship. Bless our food. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'll see you Wednesday.